Let's be honest, real-time web apps are really cool. Whether you're chatting with your friends on Discord, stalking your Uber driver on a night out, or engaging in an interactive coding session using Zed, there's something pretty magical when you're able to watch events unfold live in front of your eyes. It makes an app feel seamless, instant, immersive. But Behind the scenes, making this magic work requires some serious infrastructure. That's where frameworks come in, and this is a Gleam channel. So of course, we're going to be talking about Lustre, and my favorite Lustre feature, server components. Lustre takes the complexity out of building real-time experiences, handling all the tricky communication and state management, so you can focus on building apps that'll delight your users, all while using the Lustre patterns you're already used to. Let's have a look at how they work. Before we get into the meat of server components, it's important that you have a good understanding of the structure of a Lustre app, and also how we would go about using Lustre with server-side rendering. You'll also need to know how Gleam's concurrency model works, as Lustre server components can take advantage of Gleam's excellent scalability to serve real-time updates to thousands of clients simultaneously. Luckily for you, I have videos on all of those things, and they'll be linked in the description. If that's too long though, here's a quick recap. Lustre apps use the Model View Update, or MVU architecture. Essentially, when creating a front-end in Lustre, your UI, or your view, View is a pure function of your state, the shape of which is defined by your model. Updates to your app in the form of events or messages are applied to your current state to create a new state, which then produces a new view and the cycle continues. Background work, like making HTTP requests, are run in effects, which, when completed, emit new events to update the state. Events are usually triggered by the update function and can therefore, in turn, trigger new effects, leading to chained behaviors. When we server side render a Lustre app, we essentially run the view function to produce use an initial UI, then pass our initial state to the client, generally encoded in a JSON string in a script tag. The client can then pick up this state when it initializes and continue on with the MVU cycle from there. Server components work a little differently. Instead of just running the initial render on the server, a server component will run all of its logic on the server, sending updates to the view from the server to the client in the form of patches, which the client can then process to update the DOM. Server-client communication is handled via WebSockets, and connections are made when the component loads. On the server, assuming you're using Gleam's Erlang target, the component will run inside an actor, receiving and sending messages using Erlang's message passing systems. How you choose to set up your components will depend on your use case. You can give every individual user their own instance of the component, which might be useful if you have a live updating dashboard, and want users to be able to slice and dice data in real time. Or you could have a single instance shared by all your users, which is great if you want everyone to see the same thing, like when spectating an online chess match. Alternatively, you could go for a mix of the two, where a component is shared by a small group of users. You might go down this route if you're building a chat room, or something with real-time collaboration features like Google Docs. I think that's enough talking for now, so let's get to some code. But only after a word from this video's sponsor, CodeCrafters. CodeCrafters is the best way to level up your software engineering skills. Instead of molly coddling you through another to-do app tutorial, CodeCrafters teaches you how real software works by having you build your own versions of real software, like Redis, SQLite, and Kafka. You're given space to try and solve the problems yourself with minimal guidance, but if you need help, you can always access a library of solutions from other users. And when you're done, simply push it to the CodeCrafters Git server to run a suite of automated tests to check your solutions. I've been using Using CodeCrafters recently to learn Zig by creating an interpreter for the LOX programming language. They've also got a number of challenges in Gleam. As an educational resource, CodeCrafters should also qualify for reimbursement through your company's learning and development budget. To sweeten the deal, you can get 40% off by heading to ihh.dev slash CodeCrafters or by clicking the link in the description. By signing up with that link, you'll be directly supporting the channel, helping me bring you videos like this one. Remember, that's ihh.dev slash CodeCrafters. Anyway, code time. This is the server component example provided in the Lustre documentation. It's a very straightforward demo, but it serves as a good way to understand the basics of server components. Later in the video, I'll show you how we're going to integrate server components into the little Pokedex app we've been building over the course of this series. This is a simple counter, but each time the button is clicked, instead of running the update directly on the client, we're communicating over a WebSocket connection with our server. We can validate this by looking at our network tab when we click the button. You can see that we're sending and receiving JSON payloads that are 
passed by the Lustre runtimes on the server and the client. However, we don't actually need to worry about what's going on here. We're never going to touch this directly ourselves. I've also added a debug statement that activates when we change the count, and you can see that it's printing on the server, not in my browser console. Let's take a look at the code. There are two things we need to worry about, the component itself and the WebSocket setup. Looking at the component in counter.gleam, we can see that it's just a mini Lustre application. We've got our model and message types, as well as the init, update, and view functions we'd expect to see in a Lustre app. We also have this app function, which is just the public entry point into our component. Nothing unexpected here, really. It's just a Lustre app. The ability to run this app anywhere, on the client, the server, or both, is one of Lustre's greatest superpowers. The one thing that is worth pointing out is the use of the HTML slot component in the view function. On the client side, server components are implemented using a custom web component. By including HTML slots, we can insert custom DOM elements into our server components easily. If we look back at the demo, we can see the text, this is a slot, which doesn't exist in our component. Anyway, onto the setup code we go. This is going to look like a lot at the start, but I promise you, it's quite simple. Effectively, we have a web server set up with the mist library. This has three routes. The first, slash counter, sets up our WebSocket connection with some functions we'll get to in a sec. The second route serves Lustre's server component runtime, which is separate to the usual Lustre runtime from the priv directory of the Lustre Gleam package. Finally, we have a catch-all route that serves our page. All we've got here is a link to some CSS, a link to the aforementioned runtime, and our server component. Like I said earlier, Lustre's server components on the client are represented as web components. We'll use a custom Lustre element here with the server component.root attribute specifying the route to our WebSocket connection. You'll also notice that our p tag with the text, this is a slot, is passed in as a child of this component. Let's get into those WebSocket functions we skipped past earlier. A missed WebSocket connection needs three functions, one for initialization, one for handling messages, and one for handling connection closes. This is where we start getting into the Gleam OTP stuff. So I really do suggest you watch that video if you haven't already. In simple terms, missed WebSocket connections are handled by Gleam actors under the hood. You may remember that actors can be used to store a piece of state. We'll use that state to make sure our WebSocket connection always has a reference to our counter component in the form of an OTP subject. This subject accepts Lustre actions containing our counter's message type, allowing us to pass messages to our counter from the WebSocket handler. This is set up in our onInit function, which takes the WebSocket connection as its only argument. We don't actually need the connection in our case, so we can ignore it. Inside the onInit function, we'll create a new subject called self, which will allow us to receive messages from our server component. We'll then create an instance of our component, passing it to Lustre to start an actor to manage the component for us. Next, we use process.send to send a subscribe message to our counter, passing in an ID for our user and a callback. This callback is called the render function and will be called when the server component has a patch to send to our client. In this case, we just want our server component to send the message back to the self subject so that we can forward it on to our WebSocket handler. Finally, we return a tuple of our state, which is our counter in in this case, and a selector containing the self subject we made earlier. Mist will read from this selector and treat any messages that come in as a message to the WebSocket, allowing us to send socket messages from the server. Effectively, this, along with some code we'll see in the socket handler function, is what allows our server component to communicate with our client. This seems a bit complicated at first glance, but it's effectively creating communication channels between our component and the outside world. I'll leave a link to the code for this in the description so you can read through it on your own time and experiment with it to get a better understanding understanding of what's going on. The socket update function is fairly straightforward. It accepts our state, the WebSocket connection, and a WebSocket message. The WebSocket message is generic over the types of custom messages we can send to our WebSocket from the server. In our case, this is the Lustre patch we mentioned earlier. All we do here is match on the message with a case statement. If we've received text, it's coming from the front end, and it's probably a JSON payload with an action for our counter. Lustre provides a built-in decoder for us here, so we can use that and send the action to our counter to handle in the background. If we've received a a binary message, we don't know what to do with it, so we'll just ignore it. If the message is our custom patch from the server, we first encode that to JSON and then send it to the client over the WebSocket connection using mist.sendTextFrame. Finally, if we receive a close or shutdown message, we just stop the actor. Lastly, the socket close function takes in our state and just shuts down our server component instance. This implementation gives us one component for every user, and it works great. But what if we want to make this button multiplayer? Looking at our code, we can see that we're creating a new instance of the component on every request. Let's pull this out into the main function and pass it to the socket init function using a function capture. Now, we only have one instance that lasts for the lifetime of our program. And oh, of course, we need to make sure we just unsubscribe when we close the connection rather than shutting down the whole component. Speaking of subscriptions though, 
you should make sure you're subscribed. It'll make sure you don't miss future videos in the Luster series, like how to do routing. Now, if we open up a couple of instances of our app, we'll see that the buttons on both will update the count. But wait, the count itself is only updating in one window. What's going on here? The astute among you are probably screaming at your screens already, but do you remember what we passed into the server component dot subscribe function? That's right, it was an ID, and we've left that hard-coded as WS. Great, so let's change that. The first thing we need to be able to do is keep track of IDs, so let's create a state type that holds Holds our counter and an ID. Then, in our socket init function, we can create an ID, subscribe using that ID, and instead of returning a counter, we'll return a state value. I'm just using a random number for my ID here, but you should really use something like a UUID to reduce the chances of collisions. If you're working with logged in users, it's important not to use something like a user ID, or your users will only be able to use one instance of your component at a time. Finally, we can change our update and close functions to accept the new state and make sure the close function is unsubscribing with the correct. ID. And now everything works magically. While this seems like a lot of setup, that was just for the plumbing. The process of taking part of an existing Lustre application and turning it into a server component is really simple. Let me show you. Here's the very basic Pokedex app we've been building over the course of this series. As a reminder, when we search for a Pokemon, it gets added to our list of known Pokemon in our cache and appears in the sidebar here. What I don't like, however, is the fact that the list only gets updated for the user who did the search. It would be cool if it had update for everyone who had the page open. As we now know, we can use server components for that. I've done a lot of the plumbing already. It's basically identical to what we had in the counter example, but this time I'm embedding the server component runtime in the page directly using the server component.script function. Having it served from a separate route would allow it to be cached by the browser, but since this is just a toy app, I think it's fine. The component itself is being stored in our top level context and passed to each request that way. The first thing we need to do is copy over the Pokemon list view from our client, as well as the button it depends on. Thankfully, the button isn't used elsewhere, so we can just chuck it in the server project. Otherwise, it would probably go in shared. I'm keeping the component, as well as the requisite WebSocket function handlers, together in components slash Pokemon list.gleam. However, the WebSocket functions are going to be similar, if not the same, for most of your server components. So you might create generic versions in your own app. My model is just going to be a list of Pokemon, and the only messages I need are server added Pokemon and user selected Pokemon. Now is also a good time to talk about how our server component is going to interact with the outside world. Every HTML element can emit events which are captured by JavaScript functions on the page, and Lustre server components are no different. We can use the event.emit function from Lustre to create an effect that will emit a JavaScript event called select with the JSON encoded name of the Pokemon as our payload. Then, once we've set up our app function using Lustre.application so we can use effects, we can head back over to our client and add the server component there. As before, we use a custom element, but this time we use event.on to add a handler for our select event. This tries to decode our Pokemon name from our event and emits a client side user selected Pokemon event so the client can make the API call it needs to display the Pokemon. Since we're no longer hydrating the list of Pokemon from the server, we can also remove all the hydration related code we added in the last video. As always, the code for all of this is on GitHub, the link for which is in the description. Also, the app is a bit ugly at the moment, so I'll give it a bit of a facelift and deploy it. It'll be available at mon.ihh.dev by the time this video goes out. Server components are really cool, right? But where should you use them? And what trade-offs are you making when you do? I think server components are great when you want to show your users things in real time. This could be from something as exciting as a sports match play-by-play -play to something as mundane as upload progress for a file. In theory, you could run your entire app as a server component. And there are examples of people doing that with Phoenix Live View, which uses a very similar concept. However, since every action then requires a server round trip, you'd introduce a lot of latency, which would definitely harm the user experience. It's not recommended practice to do this with Lustre. They're called server components for a reason. So what are you gonna build with server components? Let me know in the comments below. And don't forget to get 40% off your Codecrafters subscription by going to ihh.dev slash Codecrafters. If you want to learn more about the magic behind Mist WebSockets and Lustre server components, my video on concurrency in Gleam is on the left. The one on the right is like, oh, totally random, yo, but I'll still love you if you click it. See ya.